Thank you very much, Pedro. It's, it's really nice to be here at EBD and in Sevilla. And what I'm hoping to do today is sort of give you a somewhat general talk about various projects and ways that I'm thinking and thinking that if any part of this interests you, then you know where to find me um, on the fourth floor in Alfredo's office. Mm -hmm. um, so um, what I want to talk about today is something that I've been, cre been increasingly interested in, which is the coexistence of close relatives. And so by close relatives, what I mean are these species that look very similar to each other and are closely related. And we think that coexistence of these species sort of lies at the nexus, at the point where we have historical approaches, historical contributions of recent ancestry and um, the ecological interactions to be the most prominent. So this was uh, something that Darwin was also interested in. And um, in The Origin of Species, he actually talks about this a little bit, where he says, as the species of the same genus usually have, though by no means invariably, much similarity in habits and constitution, and always in structure, the struggle will generally be more severe between them if they come into competition with each other than between the species of distinct genera. And so I want to take this quote and maybe unpack it a little bit. So if we think about the first part, as species of the same genus usually have much similarity in habits and constitution, then if we think about coexistence in communities, we might expect that this part would mean that we'd find close relatives in the same communities because they, they have the same habits and constitution, they might like the same things. Um, but then we have the struggle will generally be more severe between them. And so that would suggest that close relatives might exclude each other from the same local communities because they compete with each other more because, again, they're more similar through their shared ancestry. So it's this tension of liking the same things but then competing more and how does that actually result in coexistence of close relatives. So if we think a little bit about what does it mean to have close relatives coexist, then we have to sort of consider speciation as part of that whole pathway. So if allopatric speciation is the primary mode of speciation, then in order to have coexistence of close relatives, we have to have these species come back into secondary contact. So if that doesn't happen, they don't coexist, obviously. Um, and then if they hybridize in that secondary compact contact, then they become one species again, and they also don't coexist. So they need to be reproductively isolated. And then if they're reproductively isolated and in the same habitat, then they also have to be able to coexist ecologically. So this is where evolutionary biologists stop, and this is where ecologists start. And, but really, we have to sort of consider the whole process. So if they can't coexist ecologically, then they're also not going to coexist. So this is the kind of pathway we have to satisfy. Um, you know, if they speciate sympatrically, then we have to go directly to coexist co ecologically, and we don't, you know, we don't have to go through all those steps. But we still need this part in order to get coexistence. So what does that actually mean? Well. It might mean that you know, they can coexist even though they share enemies or they share mutualists nicely. They don't, one doesn't usurp them from the other too much. They don't outcompete each other for resources. That's what Darwin was really focused on. And they don't interfere with each other's reproduction. And this is something that I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about today um, as well. So we're really going to be focusing on these two parts here for, um, for this talk. So, you know, typically people have thought about these ideas with respect to sister species, but I'm really interested in these non-sister close relatives, so what we call congeners, if you will. Now, we understand that that rank of congener does not always mean that they're equally diverged across all these different groups, so we use DNA to tell us 
how diverged species really are, but what we are generally talking about and what taxonomists and experts recognize is that congeners just really kind of look a lot alike um, and share all of those things that Darren was talking about. And so I think it is a useful concept to think about. And I'll try and convince you of that also empirically. So what I want to do today is first test some of these ideas of Darwin's about ecological similarity and what that means for coexistence, and then explore processes that are associated with reproduction and explain how they might be important in already reproductively isolated close relatives. So how does similarity affect coexistence in close relatives? Do they prefer the same habitats? Do they compete more strongly? These were Darwin's ideas. So a lot of times this question has been approached using descriptive data collection. So people will go to the field or a, in a community and they'll survey what species are in these different community types. These are three species communities. And then they'll look at the underlying phylogeny of these species that are coexisting, and then they'll come up with some relationship between how diverged species are and whether they coexist in these communities. So in this example here, we expect the phylogenetic distance separating species in the community and their co-occurrence will look like this, where closely related species with low phylogenetic distance are likely to co-occur. And here we have the opposite, that closely related species are actually spatially repelled. So the problem with using a descriptive approach is that we have a lot of ghosts in, in that approach. We have problems of the ghosts of community assembly past, if you will, because we may have had close relatives that were very similar, but they may have already excluded each other from habitat. So what we are seeing is the outcome of that kind of interaction. Or they might be absent from the species pool altogether if allopatric speciation is you know, the most common mode, which we think it is for many species. Um, so we've had a lot of conflicting information in the literature about these kinds of patterns. And a lot of it has to do with the scale, the scale of phylogenetic distances in communities People talk about these patterns, but they don't tell us what is the minimum and the maximum phylogenetic distance that they observe between species. Um, and we know that these kinds of things can alter the outcomes and therefore our interpretations of these kinds of um, approaches. So um, we try to take an experimental approach to ask this question. And, and we think that this can override some of the ghosts. Obviously, it's not going to deal with problems of a species not being there already. But um, it, it, it helps. And then we're also taking advantage of the fact that sessile organisms like plants can be placed into the niche of another species. Um, and it won't be able to leave. So we call this the Oprah approach, where we basically planted species into the niches of other species and then interviewed them and said, and how did you like living in the niche of that relative? So that's exactly what we did at our field site. So this is working out at the Bodega Marine Reserve in California. And I did all this work with my former postdoc, Brian Anneker. And so there are a variety of um, habitats here at the reserve. This is actually a small reserve, though this is about one kilometer. Um, but what we see is a lot of different types of habitats, thanks in, in large part to the San Andreas Fault, which runs right through the reserve here. So on this side, we have this coastal grassland. And on this side, we have sand dunes, um, really quite different types of habitats. And then also, we have sort of along the cliff edge, much more um, saline because of the ocean spray. We have some topography and rockiness. And we even have some wetlands. So we have actually quite a diversity of habitats in a small range where species could potentially quite easily disperse seeds if there are birds or mammals move, moving around these areas because they're not very big. Um, and insects, too, that could pollinate and, and plants across these areas. So we designed our field transplant experiment 
using ranks. So we would basically take a species that occurred, so we're only looking at native species, Epidega, and, so, and we're only considering species that have um, congeners at the reserve somewhere. It doesn't matter where, what habitat, they just have to be somewhere there. So we have, um, for example, in this set, we have a Plantago subnuda and Plantago erecta as the congeners. We have Linaria, which is a confamilial in the same family. And then we have an extra familial, more distantly related than family, so in this case Trifolium, as a distant relative. And so for each focal species here, we would plant them into the destination species site. And we use replicate sites at the, at the reserve to do this. So this, for example, for this species, we use those sites. We did this across two years for a total of 15 focal species that were planted. They were from 12 families, so we tried to really get an idea of how generalizable is this into 51 site types um, at the reserve. And of course, again, as I say, we still have some ghosts in this design because we're only using species that have congeners at the reserve. And then these ranks were, the, the species at each rank treatment were selected at random from all those that satisfied that rank. So it took a random congener, a random confamilial, and a random distant relative from the suite of sites that we had. These are just a few other ones. These are in the APACE or carrot family. Um, these are two species of Sinicula. These is Camasoniopsis and Camasonia. Um, so just to give you a sense of the sets of pairs that, or species that we were using. So again, while treatments were assigned by rank, um, we then used a molecular phylogeny to calculate the phylogenetic distance based on a time calibrated clock of millions of years divergence um, among these species. And that's actually what we're using when we look at performance, this continuous metric. So we can look at some of the results of this experiment. Um, so on this axis, we'll have survival or growth. And on this axis, we'll have the phylogenetic distance, the millions of years separating the planted species from the resident species. So for those patches, we always pick patches where the resident was at high, the highest density that we could find at the reserve. So they're not monocultures. They're actually what's out there in the field. OK, so for survival, what we find is that the actually survival to the family level is not significantly different from congeners, con, from conspecific congener and confamilial sites but it does decrease significantly at distant relative sites. So that might suggest that these habitat preferences are conserved to the family level in terms of how young plants survive out there, because that's where we had most of our mortality is in our young plants. And then to understand the role of competition, because remember Darwin was suggesting that competition should be strongest among close relatives, we removed neighbors from some of our planted plants, and we left some with their neighbors intact. And then we um, can look at what are the effects of neighbors um, on, on the success of these species. So we, we use a metric called relative interaction intensity. So we basically took the biomass of our replicates that were left at the ambient intact community and subtracted from that the biomass of the plant where the neighbor was removed and then put that over the sum of those things. So RII has values ranging from minus one to plus one, and it's negative for competition and positive for facilitation. So here on this graph, we want to know how is the strength of competition, so more suppressed by your neighbor or even facilitated by your neighbor, and this is no effect of your neighbor, as a function of phylogenetic distance. So what we see here is that um, conspecifics suppress each other the most, and that this is still significantly positive even if we ignore conspecifics and we compare congeners, confamilials, and distant relatives, we find that there's increased suppression by close neighbors. So 
you know, Darwin had that hypothesis that close neighbors should compete more intensely, and our data support that hypothesis. So what is the net effect? Um, right, so here distant neighbors have no f competitive effects, and close relatives have significant competitive effects. And if we look at the growth of survivors in our treatments, what we can see is that it actually looks something like this, where we have a, a, a curvilinear function where we have declining performance to the level actually, it turns out that this inflection point here is actually the age of the oldest confamilials in our plot. So we're really talking about conservatism to the level of family and then a big change with distant relatives. So what we see here is that if we look at the biomass of plants, we see that they basically perform about equally well in distant relative sites and then do relatively more poorly in um, confamilial and congener sites. So this would suggest that if these processes are generally going on in the field, that we might expect that close relatives would not actually co-occur much with one another. So we wanted to know then, after we've done this experiment, whether our experiments predict the rates of coexistence of ranks in the field. So this is not Bodega, I wish it were, but um, basically it is another California, beautiful California community. Um, but we have about 200 native forbs at the reserve and so we were interested in basically trying to understand for all the species that we found in all of our plots. So we, at every site where we put out plants, we also put out a quadrat that actually quantified the species composition in those plots. And so we were interested in asking whether or not we see patterns of spatial repulsion in congeners and confamilials um, based which is what we would predict based on our experimental results. And to not bias our results, we also threw out all of our focal species and resident species from this analysis. So we're only looking at species that we didn't include in any of our experiments. So we also don't have known DNA for all of these species. So we are limited in looking at our analysis by rank, but I want to convince you that that's actually legitimate, at least here at Bodega. So these are the results I showed you based on continuous PD, and here is the same result analyzed by rank. And what you can see is that we see the same patterns if we only use rank versus if we use a continuous phylogenetic distance. So here are our quadrats. So in this particular quadrat, there are 20 species from 19 genera, so one pair of congeners in here. And so in each of these quadrats, we could calculate the probability of encountering, encountering a specific rank. And then also, we can look at the spatial distance between quadrats across the reserve and ask, how does um, the probability of encountering a particular rank change with the distance from a quadrat? So we see that the rates of co-occurrence of congeners are low and were less common than expected by chance based on a randomization test. Um, so that suggests congeners exhibit some spatial repulsion. And then we can look at this distance analysis. So what is the probability of encountering a conspecific as you increase distance from another conspecific or from a particular species? And what you see is sort of a declining function we consider that to be very consistent with our idea that plants are generally patchy, right? And so if you find a conspecific, you're likely to find another one close by. For congeners and confamilials, however, we find a slight but significant um, pattern of spatial repulsion where you're more likely to encounter a congener from increasing um, spatial dis distance from the focal. And then, you know, by subtraction, we have to find this kind of relationship with distant relatives. So um, basically, these results do support our experimental results of placing these species in each other's habitats. <laughs>
So the take home message from um, this part of the talk is that more closely related species are more ecologically similar. They survive better in each other's sites. And according, and as Darwin predicted, they also compete more strongly with each other. So there's that tension between what they like and how strongly they compete. And at Bodega, the net result of that tension is actually fine scale spatial repulsion of close relatives. So a lack of local coexistence, although you can find them at the reserve. Okay, so now I want to switch to this question of coexisting ecologically in reproductively isolated species. So what other forces other than competition could drive um, spatial repulsion? So Darwin was really focused on competition, but um, this process of reproductive interference may also be a special challenge of close relatives. So what is reproductive interference? It is basically an interspecific interaction, an interaction between two species that are reproductively isolated, so they're not going to be hybridizing, so it's not about reinforcement. They're already reproductively isolated during the process of mate acquisition that reduces the fitness of at least one of the species involved. Um, it's also been, it has a lot of different names in the literature, actually, so it's a little bit of a hard field to review. Both plant and animal biologists talk about it in different ways. So it's sometimes called like competition via pollination in plants. And there are a number of other ways that people have expressed this idea. But um, again, this is happening after species are reproductively isolated. And as such, it could, it could affect a much larger group of species, in fact. And this is actually something we talk about in this annual review that we wrote recently. So, it happens most often in congeners, so this is what got me interested in it because, again, it's a f something that's going to affect coexistence and close relatives. You could imagine that a pollinator that's looking for small white flowers might visit this plant and also visit this plant, or these two congeners that coexist at Bodega, Lasthenia californica and Lasthenia minor. Um, so the opportunities for pollinators to move pollen from this species onto this species that's reproductively isolated might provide pr opportunities for this species to interfere with the success of this other species. And it's not just in plants, it's also in animals. Um, we know natural selection has favored males wanting to mate with most things um, indiscriminately, and that females are the more discriminating sex. And so what we often find is that males will try and mate with females from another species that look similar. And this has been documented in many cases. This is a picture of two um, European frogs. And, um, and one of them um, is suppressed by the other because after amplexus, the female drops her eggs and the males fertilize it, but it, it doesn't work. So she's spending a lot of her energy on eggs that are not getting fertilized. So reproductive interference may generate alley-like frequency-dependent effects that might prevent the coexistence of close relatives. So now I'm going to be very harsh and make you think a little bit about coexistence theory in ecology. So sorry about that for those of you who are not up on this stuff. But the coexistence, the conditions for ecological coexistence, as we understand them from many models, but you know the most popular ones are these Chessonian-style models right now. They absolutely rely on negative frequency-dependent fitness benefits in competition. So the idea is that the strongest competition a species will face is from conspecifics. And, you know, pretty much that is the case and was the case in our experiments there, right? The most suppressed plants by neighbors were suppressed by conspecifics. So the idea here is that when there's a, a species in a dense patch, all those individuals are busy suppressing one another heavily, and that allows a new species to come in and it will be automatically less suppressed because conspecific competition is strongest. And that will give it a competitive advantage as it moves into this area when it is rare. 
So these populations, so these individuals have to be able to increase when rare in order for coexistence to, to happen. So you can invade a patch because your fitness is not as suppressed. So that is based on negative frequency dependence. But if reproductive interference is also frequency dependent, that is, if you're the rare female and you're surrounded by males that are interested in mating with you but only cause you hurt and harm, then that is not going to allow you to capitalize on this competitive release that you gain from being at low frequency. So the fitness gains from competitive release may be offset by fitness losses to reproductive interference. Um, and actually, there have been um, some models by Kishi in Japan, and I became interested in this, so I, I tapped my most excellent modeler colleague, Sebastian Schreiber, and we have been trying to look at how does reproductive interference alter the conditions for coexistence, and I'm not going to um, bore you with it, but basically we're looking here at the sort of the green and light blue zones are areas where reproductive interference might happen and then we're looking at niche overlap and relative fitness which are parts of the models that you don't need to know. All you really need to know is looking at the percent reproductive interference and how this zone changes. So with 5%, 10% and 25% reproductive interference, we're really narrowing the conditions under which we can find coexistence of these species, even when they have a competitive advantage when rare. The other thing about reproductive interference is it's almost always asymmetrical. So um, it almost always affects one species more than the other, and it's often really strong anywhere from 5 to 60 percent I'm in a brief literature review that I'm doing right now. And it's actually been looked at most often in congeners, so it's also been found most often in, in congeners. And it, it makes more sense that they would be the most likely to experience this because they often will reproduce at the same time, they look similar, and because of their shared ancestry they may offer, they may occupy the same or nearby habitats. So I'd like to convince you in the rest of this talk that it's not just about competition, but may also be about reproductive interference that is um, affecting how we find coexistence in close relatives. So in 2009, Levin proposed that habitat partitioning could pave the way to speciation in plants if flowering time was determined by habitat and habitat divergence caused flowering time divergence, therefore preventing gene pools from um, exchanging genes across habitats. But I would like to argue that habitat separation might also reduce reproductive interference, potentially by altering flowering time, and also potentially by spatial separation. So again, at Bodega, we were interested in exploring how flowering time was related to habitat use and specifically comparing flowering overlap of congeners at the reserve. So we started out by surveying 59 species in the field and focusing on sets of congeners. And then what we really wanted to do was have a larger sample size because these are actually very time consuming kinds of data. So we related our field observation for these 59 species to the flowering time that's recorded in the Jepson Manual. The Jepson Manual, for those who don't know, is actually an online database at this point. It is amazing. It will tell you anything you want to know about a plant species in California, where it grows, its range, its flowering time. It'll give you photographs of the specimens. It is absolutely a gold mine and allows us California botanists to have like so many more resources at our fingertips and Bruce Baldwin who runs the, the Jepson Herbarium is a genius anyway. <laughs> but um, what we were able to do is sort of say, well, how do our observation for these 59 species in the field correspond to those that were in the Jepson manual? And we found that our flowering time were very well correlated, like 0.7. So we felt that that gave us the opportunity to expand our analysis to all of the co-occurring species at, 
at Bodega, where we know which habitats they're in, and allowed us to examine patterns in the whole flora. So we were interested in comparing differences in flowering time by relatedness of species and by their habitat use. So this is just an example of some of the species. And um, you can, we find that flowering time has very weak phylogenetic signal um, using Blomberg's K. I'm not a really big fan of Blomberg's K, and we can talk about that some other time. Um, here I'm also plotting the grass, the different types of habitat that I showed you in that initial graph, and also whether or not species were perennial or annual. And then this were from our, what we observed, and this was from the whole flora. And what you can see is that, you know, it's significant but not strong phylogenetic signal in flowering time. You know, that's looking at the whole tree. What we really want to be zooming in on is, is like what's happening with congeners here. And this is only the peak flowering. Um, if we look at habitat use, that's actually quite a bit more conserved. So close relatives tend to be, or closer relatives tend to be found in the same types of habitats. And if you're an annual or perennial, your, your close relatives are more likely to share that same life history. So if we ask what's the best model to explain flowering time at Bodega, we have all of these attributes of phylogeny, habitat, and life history, which explains about 50% of the flowering time differences at Bodega that we can observe. But what about close relatives? Because that's really what we're interested in. So congeners have more similar flowering time than non-congeners on average. The median divergence was around 20 days less between congeners and non-congeners, and that's in peak flowering, so there's some overlap around there. And 15% of congeners had complete overlap in flowering time, while only about 10% of non-congeners did. So there's more opportunity for congeners to interfere with each other in terms of co-flowering together. You know, does habitat shifts, which remember we found spatial repulsion, does habitat shift provide a way to alter flowering time and potentially reduce reproductive interference? And the answer is no. <laughs> habitat shifts do not alter flowering time. If life history does, it increases, um, it, you actually flower later if you're a perennial, and if you both shift habitats, and alter your flowering time, and you alter your habitat, sorry, if you alter your, both your habitat and your life history with a close relative, then you actually really do diverge in flowering time substantially. So <clears throat> what's interesting and what's consistent with our experimental results are that the majority of congener pairs differed in one or both habitat or life history shifts. So suggesting that there is a, that this spatial repulsion is definitely there and that that is more frequent than the null expectation of shifts for any pair of species. So there's been some selective force for congeners to not co-occur. So um, habitats and spatial repulsion could end up um, reducing reproductive interference by spatially separating congeners, but we would also predict these same spatial shifts as a result of resource competition. So which is it, reproductive interference or resource competition? And remarkably few papers have actually tried to separate out these two kinds of um, forces that are acting on congeners that are nearby. So I just want to go over a few studies that were not my studies at all but just to try and convince you a little bit more that this is something that could be important. Um, these are the studies I'm gonna talk about were both done by students at Davis whose committees I served on, but they were actually Maureen Stanton students. So this is a study of limnanthes, two species of meadow foam <coughs> at, in California. This is one of the kinds of data you can get from the Jepson Herbarium uh, online is you can look at the distribution of all the collected specimens and you can see that they have um, quite a lot of range overlap here at a coarse scale. And the study was done in this area here where you can see there's, you can see the circle there and there, that they're in very close proximity. You actually don't find them in the same pool. 
Um, and this was work done by Ryan Briscoe Runquist. These are reproductively isolated species. They're not even sister species. Um, they make no hybrids. Okay. So when you look at where they're found, um, even when they're found close by, they're not found in exactly the same parts of the pool. This one tends to be a little <coughs> higher up. This one tends to be a little lower down. And those, where they occur on the pool, affects their flowering phenology. So um, these ones will flower before these guys because the pool will be full for longer. So um, what Ryan did was first she transferred pollen between these species. And what she found was that this um, rosea suffers from reduced seed set when alba pollen is put on it, but not in the other way around. And then she put out what you would sort of scenarios of what you might predict if a rosea landed in the vernal pool occupied by alba and vice versa by putting out these arrays where she manipulated the frequency of these different species in their each other's habitats. And then what she showed in looking at these arrays is that pollinators will easily move between these plants. Like they don't, sub, they only, they don't just forage on one species, as you might imagine, because it's really kind of hard to see the differences here between these species. So if we look at the results, we have the decreasing frequency of rosea in these arrays, and then we have seed sets per plant. And so when rosea is an invader, into alba habitats, it has a really great reduction in seed set. In, in, on the contrary, alba is not really strongly affected by um, being at low frequency in a rosea pool. So reproductive interference may partially explain this fine scale exclusion of inland nanthes. My guess is that alba does not tolerate submersion and that these guys would probably do just fine at the outer end of the pond if a limnanthes alba wasn't there. But that would be the next set of experiments to do. So I apologize for ripping you away from California. <laughs> well, not quite. But I want to talk a little bit about this other large project that I've been working on, which is understanding trait evolution in this group of mustards. And in particular, here I want to talk a little bit about floral evolution in this clade, because it does eventually relate back to some of these themes. So this is the clade I've spent the last 10 years working on and I've kind of fallen in love with. They're called jewel flowers. While they are mustards, you, unless you're a fabulously good botanist, you would never probably recognize them as mustards. Well, maybe this one, but um, a lot of them have these inflated urns. They grow in a large variety of habitats. Most of the clade can be covered from Anza Borrego up to Oregon. And so um, there are about uh, 30 species there. And so we've been doing a lot of work studying these 30 species in their natural habitats. But um, we were interested in floral scent evolution in Streptanthus and what factors pre predict scent divergence or convergence. And with respect to um, reproductive interference, we're interested in overlap with close relatives. So this work was done with Marjorie Weber, who, is a, who was a postdoc and has now moved on, and my colleague Santiago Ramirez. So, we grew 34 populations of 23 species in a common garden. We know there are phylogenetic relationships. And then we sampled the headspace of these plants. And then we analyzed this using a GC mass spec, removing plastic compounds from the bags. And what you can see is that there's a, a, a large diversity and of odor complexity in this group. We identified 65 unique compounds. And these are just sort of, you can see that they vary a lot across um, these species. And we, can, we looked at scent complexity, which is just the number of peaks. And then we could calculate sort of how many peaks do these species share, calculating a Bray-Curtis dissimilarity index. And then we can also look at, with respect to reproductive interference, these are all congeners, so how much range overlap do they share? 
Um, and how is that related to scent divergence? So, and floral traits. So here what we see is if we look at the phylogenetic distance separating species on the tree as a function of a difference in flower size, we see that um, more closely related species have more similarly, similarly sized flowers. So in all these graphs, zero means very little difference between flowers and a high number means a big difference between flowers. So you can see here that um, phylogenetic distance predicts floral size similarity. In contrast to flower size, the scents are significantly more dissimilar between close relatives. So even though the flowers are the same size, they um, really smell very different. So closely related species don't share scent compounds. So if we're interested in forces like reproductive interference, we might be interested in range overlap. Um, so we would predict greater trait divergence for species in sympatry. And we already know from work that my PhD student has done that these species are reproductively isolated. Very few of them make any kind of hybrids. So does sympatry predict divergence in flower size? Here we have red, red pairs that are sympatric and blue pairs that are allopatric. And you can see that there's no difference in the cloud of red and blue points. So the phylogenetic distance separating species does not, um, or sorry, that whether or not they're sympatric or allopatric, whether or not their ranges overlap does not affect how different their size is. But we've already showed that floral scent is a lot more labile evolutionarily than flower size. So what's happening when we look at floral scent? And here we have an interesting pattern. And literally, I got these data like two days ago, so I can't give you all the stats on it yet. But if we look at <coughs> allopatric pairs, which have no range overlap at all, we see that there's like a whole, you can smell similar, you can smell intermediately, or you can smell really different. But if we look at species that have range overlap, we have none that smell similar down here. So, um, what we really need to do is tease out the relationship between phylogenetic distance and range overlap in predicting these patterns of dissimilarity, and that is a work in progress. So, but it looks to me like um, if I had to wager on what our results would be, that range overlap does seem to promote greater dissimilarity. Um, so, a final note of caution when we're doing these kinds of comparative approaches to understand processes like reproductive interference, which are happening at local scales, is that our scales of range overlap from floras might be a little bit too coarse. Um, and so I just want to talk about one more study that um, another graduate student from Davis um, did, Dina Grossenbacher where she was studying these two species of mimulus, mimulus gittatus and mimulus bicolor. So mimulus bicolor has two morphs, the bicolor morph with the white top petal and yellow, and then the all yellow morph. And if you look carefully at their ranges, what you see is that in some cases, the um, mimulus gittatus is present. That's in the open. Um, symbols, and here mimulus gittatus is absent, and the frequency of the pies represent the frequency of the white morph versus the all yellow morph. And you can see that these are very close spatial proximity, but what you should notice is that the yellow morph um, yeah, is not occurring where mimulus gittatus is absent, so these all have double rings. So the idea is that this morph looks too much like mimulus gittatus, and if they co-occur, may suffer from reproductive interference. So if we look here at the frequencies, this is what I should have just taken you here. When mimulus gittatus is absent, then you have much lower frequency of the white morph, and when mimulus gittatus is present, then you have a much higher frequency of this bicolor morph. And what we find is that the presence of gutatus reduces seed set of the yellow morph in floral arrays. And so here we see that in the absence of gutatus, the morphs are 
very similar, and in the presence of gutatus, the yellow morph has a much lower fitness than the white morph. So, um, and yellow bicolor morphs get more heterospecific pollen from gutatus than do the bicolor morphs. So, this is a case where at these very local scales, we're seeing reproductive interference between mimulus gutatus and mimulus bicolor, favoring the white morph, which might otherwise have, um, yeah, favoring the white morph. So, Range overlap per se might be too coarse to detect some of these effects. What we might be seeing is also character divergence at the population level when we're looking for reproductive interference. And some other examples of this are in Clarkia, there's more character divergence between congeners in zones of close sympatry than in other areas of the range. So, returning to the question of how important is reproductive interference in explaining coexistence in congeners, I would propose that we could do a number of tests. We could test if habitat partitioning is solely about competition. We could grow species together in each other's habitats and measure the strength of competition as I did, for example. And then we can control pollination to remove reproductive interference. So we could add conspecific pollen to species that are growing <coughs> with close relatives and, or and then see whether or not we actually can separate the effects of competition versus reproductive interference. Another prediction we might make is that since most of these effects are asymmetric, the species more affected by reproductive interference will be more likely to exhibit trait shifts, trait shifts when in sympatry. So that might be character displacement, or it might be a habitat shift, or a resource use shift. But that's the one that can't afford to be in close contact with the other congener. Or another way of saying it is that perhaps the species experiencing the greater reproductive interference would become more of an ecological specialist. And we might also predict that, especially for plants, congeners might coexist more frequently locally if one or both species are selfers. So if they're selfing, and, and even if they're obligately selfing, then they're not going to be hindered by heterospecific pollen deposition. And that will really allow us to tease apart whether competition is the thing that's separating these guys versus reproductive interference. And so we're actually trying to test some of these ideas right now at the DEGA again, where we have um, eight annual species of trifolium that buck the trend that they often co-occur at very small spatial scales. Um, there's always an exception whenever you do an ecological experiment, and these guys were our exception. And, but what you'll notice is that some of these species have extremely small flowers that are you know, pretty much all selfing. And then we have other species that have very large flowers. This one is an obligate outcrosser, and we expect that this one is too. And, we can look at rates of local coexistence of these species across the reserve and also do our supplemental pollination um, trials to see whether these species are less social and more spatially isolated. In fact, they are more spatially isolated at the reserve than these guys are. And is that due to reproductive um, interference or habitat preferences or both? So we're in the process of testing that this year. So, what I want you to take home from this sort of long, rambling talk is that close relatives share habitat preferences. They compete strongly for resources, and they're similar in flowering time and in floral phenotypes. And in animals, many of them are just generally similar in their phenotypes. That the net effect of this being close relative at BMR is more spatial separation, greater rates of habitat shifts, and more flowering time overlap in close relatives. And that reproductive interference could be an underappreciated force generating spatial rep repulsion of reproductively isolated close relatives. And so we need more tests to experimentally tease apart the role of these different processes in determining coexistence in close relatives. And so with that, I will say thank you um, and thank all the people in my lab who always give me fabulous ideas, people who've helped us out in the field with these experiments, and 
the help that we get at our field sites from our great field coordinators. Thank you.